Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about demonstration when we're learning motor skills. Um, so a demonstration is a very common way that we communicate how to perform a skill. Um, so modeling is just another term for demonstration. So it's the use of demonstration as a way of telling somebody how to do something. Um, observational learning is from the learner's perspective, if someone models the behavior or performs the skill, um, then the person watching is learning the skill by observing the person who is modeling. Um, demonstration is more effective under certain circumstances than others, and that's what we're going to talk about here. Uh, so it's important that when you're teaching someone a new motor skill that you're considering whether demonstration is really the best way to communicate how to perform that skill. Um, so we should be deciding whether to demonstrate based on our knowledge of what the person's actually perceiving when you demonstrate the skill. Um, now, the difference here, we're not just saying what are they looking at, but what are they actually taking in? What are they actually seeing when you demonstrate and perceiving about the skill that you're demonstrating? Now, what they're perceiving could be conscious or non-conscious. So they may be aware and able, able to articulate what they're seeing, or it may be more subconscious and they're taking in that information and don't necessarily know that they're taking it in. Um, the observer perceives information about the coordination pattern of the skill. Um, so when an observer is watching someone demonstrate a skill, the visual system is taking in the movement pattern that they're witnessing, and they're sort of translating that information into movement commands so that they can reproduce that action. Um, we don't yet know how the brain actually does that, but we are visually taking in the information of the movement and then transferring that into a motor command uh, or more motor coordination so that we can produce that action as similarly as possible. Um, so whether demonstration is the best form of communication depends on the characteristics of the skill. Most importantly, it depends on whether the skill is a completely new uh, pattern of coordination or whether you are changing parameters of the skill characteristics for a previously learned pattern of coordination. Uh, so like if it's a totally new skill that the person hasn't done before and hasn't begun to learn, then demonstration is going to be the best way to communicate how to perform that skill. If the person already has the skill essentially, but you're gonna change the parameter characteristics. So like, let's say uh, it's a rehab setting and they're relearning how to walk, then that might be the um, movement pattern or that's the skill and they've established that skill, but maybe now you wanna change the parameter characteristics and maybe have them walking between cones or stepping over something or carrying something. And in that case, demonstration is not going to be an effective way to communicate that. Instead, you can uh, use other forms of communication like verbal communication, for example. Uh, so demonstration when you are just changing the parameters of an already learned skill is not effective. Um, so when it comes to demonstration or observation of someone completing that skill, um, we're going to get the most out of watching someone who is highly skilled at that movement. Uh, so it's preferable to learn from a skilled demonstrator because when the observer is watching the demonstration, they're taking in all the information about the coordination pattern. So the more accurate and correctly performed that coordination pattern is done, the more accurate that coordination information is going to be that that person is absorbing and then using to create their own motor program. Um, now, with that said, beginners also can benefit from observing other beginners, but with a few caveats, with some guidance. Um, so the observer will um, benefit from watching another beginner because it helps them engage in problem solving. So if a beginner watches another beginner, they can watch and be thinking, well, maybe their foot should have been over here or why didn't that work? You know, So it helps them with the cognitive process of problem solving um, as an observer watching someone else who's trying to problem solve their own actions. 
So in a learning environment, pairing two learners, so that could be two people who are in physical therapy, maybe working on a similar problem. Um, that could be two athletes on a team or, or whatever the situation, but pairing learners um, where they can take turns observing the other uh, can be really useful, but there does need to be some coach or um, physical therapist or someone who is kind of giving guidance and helping them see what they should be looking for. Um, they could have a written checklist for certain qualities or points that they could be looking for while they're observing each other. And then they can look through their checklist and um, and work together to problem solve how to meet the requirements of that skill. Uh, Self-observation is also useful. So if you video record the beginner and then the beginner watches the video back, that can be useful. But again, they need someone with experience, someone who is good at that skill to help them watch that video back to be able to detect uh, what the problems were and what can be done better. Uh, so timing and frequency of demonstration. So if we are learning a completely new skill in which demonstration is appropriate, um, then the skill should be demonstrated before the beginner starts to practice, because otherwise, how will the beginner know what they should be trying to do? Um, and then the instructor should demonstrate as frequently as necessary um, while that beginner is learning that coordination pattern. So the more frequently a beginner observes a skill being demonstrated, the more opportunity the beginner has to acquire the movement pattern. So when you demonstrate that motor pattern, the observer is taking that in and translating that what they're witnessing into their own motor pattern. So the more times they see it done, the more opportunity they have to collect correct, accurate information to help them uh, produce a correct, accurate motor plan. Uh, auditory modeling is another um, example of demonstration. So we usually think of demonstration as being something visual, but it can also be auditory. Um, so there are certain skills that will benefit more from auditory demonstration than visual demonstration. Um, so most notably, something where timing or rhythm um, is, is a critical aspect of the skill, um, that will benefit from auditory modeling, where you're auditory, auditorily, <laughs> verbally, <laughs> I don't know, but where you're providing um, an auditory rhythm. So it could be with music or with counting or clapping or something uh, we're helping to provide the timing or the rhythm for the skill that they're learning. So for example, maybe someone is learning a sequence of dance steps. Um, they will benefit more from hearing the music or the rhythm that they should be dancing along to rather than visually watching the dance if there's no auditory, uh, if there's no music or rhythm to go with it. So uh, in comparison, if we just play the music, or they can visually watch the dance to the correct rhythm without the music, they'll get more out of the music. Um, so there are a couple theories involved here that are a little bit in competition with one another. So first, I'm going to talk about cognitive mediation theory. Um, so under this theory, it says that when a person observes a skilled model, so a, an experienced demonstrator, uh, the person translates the observed movement information into a cognitive code that the person stores in memory and uses to perform the skill. And again, we don't exactly know how we do that, uh, but we watch the skilled demonstrator, we take in that information, and then we translate it into um, a way to produce that movement ourselves. The memory representation serves as a guide for performing the skill and as a standard for error detection and correction. So it's like we take that movement pattern in and store it, and then that becomes the ideal. And when we are practicing and trying to replicate that movement, we are comparing what we're doing against what we perceive that we're supposed to be doing. So we use that as a standard to detect the amount of error so that we can correct and try to execute the movement correctly. Um, so four sub processes are involved under this theory. First is the attention process. Um, so the observer has to actually pay attention and perceive and take in the actions of the demonstrator. 
The retention process is when the observer is transforming what they're taking in um, and storing it in their memory. Behavior reproduction is the translation of what they've stored in memory into the actual action, the actual coordination pattern to produce the physical action. And then the motivation process is the incentive or motivation to actually perform the action. So that is cognitive mediation theory. Another way to look at it is from a dynamic view of modeling. Um, and it's very similar, but the difference is that um, under this theory or under this model, the visual system is capable of automatically processing the observed movement in a way that constrains the motor control system. So we don't need to actually engage cognitive mediation. So the idea here is that we do it so automatically that there's no need to even transform the information we're observing into a cognitive code to store in memory. So it's very similar to the last theory, but where we're removing the step of having to actually transform it and store it in memory. Um, so there is research that supports both philosophies, both theories. Um, so there isn't enough evidence to say which one is really how it takes place. It might be a, a combination of both. It might depend on the skill or the individual. We don't know. All right. Now, finally, there are a couple downsides of demonstration in the learning of motor actions. Um, the first is that there are so many different ways to perform any given skill. So if I demonstrate a skill and somebody is observing to learn that skill, the way that I do it may not necessarily be the most optimal way for that person who's observing to do it. Um, there are certain skills where there's like one right way to really do it the best, but there most skills are not that way. Most skills um, you know, the, the geometry of how our bodies are designed are so individual that there will be slight differences in how each of us will perform a skill and be able to successfully complete the goal of the action. Um, so in that case, the downside of demonstration is that how I demonstrate it may not be the best way for you to perform that skill. Um, and so if you're learning it the way I do it, it may not be the optimal way for you to do it. Um, it also takes away the opportunity for the learner to sort of problem solve and come up with their own movement strategies. Um, because if they're trying to do it the way I'm doing it, they're doing that instead of problem solving and finding the best way for them to do it. So in some cases, that isn't ideal. We want them to do it this correct way. Uh, but for some skills, depending on what it is, the best way might be for them to do that problem solving and find the, the most effective way for that person to do that skill. So in that case, you wouldn't want to demonstrate or at least not very much. You wouldn't want to overly demonstrate um, so that they're trying so hard to replicate what you're doing. You want them to come up with their own way. The other downside is that when we watch a skilled performer demonstrate an action too many times, it can actually make the observer think that they have learned that ability or acquired that ability when they haven't. Uh, so this has been demonstrated throughout the literature. It's a really interesting phenomenon that the more we watch a skilled person do an action, the more confident we become in our own ability to also perform that action, even if we've never done it before, or even if we're a beginner and, and really haven't mastered it yet. Um, so we do have to be careful in some cases that we don't demonstrate so much that that they become overly confident in their abilities. In some cases, it might be okay, it may not hurt anything, but there can be skills where it could actually be dangerous if the person is overconfident in their ability and thinks they can do some kind of crazy skateboard trick or a gymnastic stunt or something. There are, there are skills where if you're overconfident in your ability and you don't actually have the ability to do that skill yet, that it can be dangerous, that they may not be cautious enough they may not you know, pay enough attention to the different steps leading up to it, and they could be injured uh, trying to perform that skill. So some, it's a weird phenomenon, but it has been demonstrated pretty consistently in the literature. So something to consider. All right. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a great day.